Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. If I sound a little bad, it is because right now I'm currently very sick. Uh, but I wanted to give everybody an update in the retrial of the USA versus Fox case, uh, aka the Michigan Whitmer kidnapping plot case. Um, that uh, retrial began August 9th, and as you know, I will be going to Michigan to cover the verdict in this case. Um, but I wanted to just do an update on the past couple days of what's been going on because some amazing information has in fact come out uh, during these past two days, including the FBI admitting to planting evidence in this case, which is just incredible in and of itself. That should have been the end of it, but of course it's not. Just a caveat here at the beginning, I want to let everyone know I've received another strike on my channel. Uh, this is the second one now, so um, if I get one more, they're going to yeet this entire channel. If you do not mind, please subscribe to my Substack newsletter, the, the link of which will be provided in the video description, and make sure you subscribe to my backup channel. I will also include the link to that in the video description as well, because I don't think this channel is going to be around much longer, and if you'd like to be able to continue to find me and follow my work, subscribe to the Substack newsletter. That way I can send you guys email notifications. You'll get an email every time I publish something. I can let you guys know where to find me and uh, what I'm working on. And the backup channel is called The Radix Report. Subscribe there. There is nothing wrong with that channel so far. So before we get into what, is, uh, what has come out so far during the retrial, um, let's just give some background. For people who are unfamiliar maybe with this case, uh, a group of men were arrested October 7th of 2020 by the FBI, and um, it was presented as the FBI had foiled an attempt to kidnap and murder the governor of Michigan, uh, Gretchen Whitmer. And the reason for this, they claimed, was due to um, anger over her lockdown policies, okay? So... A lot of things came out during the trial. I have written over 20 articles on this case. If you want to find that information, you can go to patriotsoapbox.com. Just type in the search bar, um, Whitmer, Michigan, FBI informant, whatever. You can t use lots of different search terms, but you know you can type in USA versus Fox, and you'll get all of those articles. Some of them are also on my Substack, but I had I didn't have a Substack at first, so I was still publishing on the PSB website. Once I got the Substack, then I started publishing some stuff there. So you'll find over 20 plus articles on the PSB website and on my Substack covering this trial in depth. And what we learned during the course of this trial was that the FBI essentially ran the entire thing from start to finish. There were over 12 FBI informants that were used in this case, uh, as well as two undercover FBI agents, um, Big Dan, codename Thor, the lead FBI informant in this case, rose to become the second in command of the Wolverine Watchmen, essentially leading the what they called field FTX, field training exercises, the tactical training uh, of the group. And um, he was the one that brought in Adam Fox into the Wolverine Watchmen against the uh, complaints and objections of other members. And in fact, two, a couple people left the Watchmen group when Fox was brought in because they thought that he was autistic, sort of, and like a loose cannon. They kind of thought that the guy was crazy. Adam Fox was a mentally ill man living in the basement of a vacuum repair shop called The Vac Shack. And uh, Barry Croft was a man who lived um, in a different state who was uh, ostensibly a member of the Three Percenters. He also was not part of the group. So it was just kind of a random guys that like the FBI kind of threw together when they uh, conducted a nationwide meetup of militia groups that was organized at the behest of the FBI. And we learned, in fact, that a lot of the Three Percenter state chapters, they were le led by like the president of each state chapter was basically an FBI informant, except in two states, Delaware, where Barry Croft was the ostensibly the head of the three percenters there, and Virginia, uh, where the man that was the head of the Virginia three percenters was being surveilled by the FBI, and they in fact tried to ensnare him in this plot. Uh, FBI Special Agent Jason Chambers had told Big Dan with regards to the uh, Michigan three percenters that the 
plan is to kidnap and execute the governor uh, that of Michigan, specifically. That was Ralph Northam at the time. They wanted this to be like some multi-state uh, DT um, bust, right, that they could take credit for and claim that there were militia groups that were going to be doing this in each state, right? Storming the state capitals, like what happened in Lansing, Michigan, uh, in June of 2020. Um, so it's there's very interesting things. And then the guy who was the head of the Detroit field office of the FBI, D'Antuono, he is promoted to be head of the Washington, D.C. field office after this arrest. So he is currently overseeing the J6 prosecutions. So there is a lot of really weird things going on in there. But before we get into this retrial, and you can, you know, if you need to familiarize yourself even more, just go look at my past articles on this. The misconduct of the FBI in this case was egregious, and it's probably too much to mention in one video. I do have other videos about this on my channel, but I tend to not put i'm limited in what i can say here and you guys know why now i have two strikes on my channel so there you go but you can read my articles about this where you can get all of the information i link to the court documents you can see it and read it yourself and i really think that i even have audio there an 18 minute audio clip of uh, the undercover informant talking to adam fox and you can just see how nonsensical this all was and how ridiculous so before we talk about what's going on in the retrial of Barry Croft and Adam Fox, I just want to remind you guys who we're dealing with here when we talk about the nation's premier law enforcement agency, the FBI, taking a knee for Black Lives Matter. The FBI, as you can see here, with several obese members. Um, okay, <laughs> all right. Now let's talk about what happened uh, at the retrial, what we've learned so far. And I excuse my my voice if I sound funny. I am very sick and I'm still kind of um, overcoming that. So anyways, this is up on my Substack. You guys can uh, subscribe to that to get the email notifications. Again, the link is in the video description. But I published this today. FBI admits to planting evidence in Michigan Whitmer kidnapping plot retrial. Things are off to an amazing start on day two of the retrial. So let's talk about what we have learned so far. Grand Rapids, Michigan, the USA versus Fox at all, a.k.a. the Michigan Whitmer kidnapping plot retrial began August 9th, 2022 with a jury selection. Many of the prospective jurors talked about a general distrust of the government. So I think that that's obviously a good thing. And I think that that's something that is more and more common nowadays. It used to be sort of back in the day and not that long ago, quite frankly, uh, people would say that like, well, the government could indict a ham sandwich, meaning they could get a grand jury to produce an indictment uh, based on like nothing, like little to no evidence, because people tended to trust the government and federal agents and just assumed that if they were seeking an indictment and impaneling a grand jury, then they must have a reason for it. People tended to have that trust of the system. That's no longer the case now, especially after what we've seen since 2016 and the erosion of faith in our institutions as we've learned more and more about corruption. And I think one of the main contributors to this was the Jeffrey Epstein debacle, because that was something that is not really a political thing. Um, I think everybody is against sex trafficking, right, and human trafficking. And so to see how that was purposefully mishandled, to see the co-conspirators not brought to justice, not even investigated, Leslie Wexner, the man um, who was funding Jeffrey Epstein, giving him his money, giving him the properties he was operating out of has not even been questioned by the FBI. As far as I know, he certainly hasn't been charged with aiding and abetting Jeffrey Epstein's criminal enterprise, of which, of course, he was doing. So I think people see that and they know now instinctively that we should not trust these institutions blindly anymore. So now that is having the effect of going down to even on the um, the local level, state, local level at things like this, right? When the government brings these cases against people, they're no longer being given the benefit of the doubt. 
Uh, the previous trial ended with no convictions, but with two men, Brandon Caserta and Daniel Harris, acquitted. So basically, they found that the FBI entrapped those men, and that's why they found them not guilty. That was the argument that defense attorneys made, and the jurors believed them, and they acquitted those men. But when it came to Adam Fox and Barry Croft, the jury could not come to a conclusion, so a mistrial was declared to those two defendants. The government decided to retry Adam Fox and Barry Croft, so jury selection proceeded on August 9th. The New York Times even is reporting on the uphill battle the government faces in trying to retry this case in these two defendants. Prosecutors face distrust in second try to prove plot to kidnap Michigan's governor. Two men are charged with conspiring to kidnap Governor Gretchen Whitmer. But a first trial ended with no convictions and questions about the FBI's tactics. Yes, exactly. Four months after one of the most closely watched DT trials in recent history ended with zero convictions, federal prosecutors are trying again to convince Michigan jurors that there was a plot in 2020 to kidnap Governor Gretchen Whitmer, set off explosives, and foment a civil war. But to prove their case against the two defendants, Barry Croft and Adam Fox, prosecutors will have to persuade jurors to trust a sprawling FBI investigation that it embedded several federal operatives in the group, including an informant who was named second in command of a militia and an under undercover agent who offered to provide explosives. Building that trust was already hard, as jurors showed in April, when they acquitted two men and failed to reach verdicts for Mr. Croft and Mr. Fox. But it may be more difficult at a time of even higher political tension. With Ms. Whitmer, a Democrat campaigning for re-election, an FBI agent searching former President Trump's Florida home this week, a move many Republicans have decried as a weaponization of the Justice Department. Quote, for the defense, this really is perfect timing for them because their case is built around distrust of the FBI, unquote, said Matthew Schneider, who served as the top federal prosecutor in the eastern Michigan during Mr. Trump's presidency and said he was involved in the early stages of the kidnapping plot investigation. Lovely that the New York Times uses a bias source uh, for quotes in this article but that's what they do we should not be surprised you could read the full new york times article i've archived it and linked it there if you want to read the rest of it but yes when you're listening in <coughs> excuse me when we were listening into jury selection there were a lot of interesting things that were asked i mean some of the people there said that they didn't really listen to the news at all there was one woman who is a cosmetologist who said that she has a generalized anxiety disorder, so she doesn't really watch the, the news, especially mainstream news. And she said she believed that news, especially mainstream news, always has an agenda and they don't give you all of the information. But interestingly, she also said she believed that the alternative media has their own agenda. And so she doesn't just blindly trust them either. But she did say she has a general distrust of the government. And she thought that that might be something that could be a bias, but that she could, she believes she'd be able to overlook that. There was another man um, who was a potential juror, I think juror number 62. And uh, he talked about how his cousin was involved with um, CPS and that that experience led to these children being abused at the hands of CPS and that that created mistrust in him with the system in general, like the justice system in America. So it, there were lots of other people that ha had a, a variety of political opinions and backgrounds and um, things like that, that there were, it's a variety of people, but this was sort of something that seemed to be, uh, present with a number of these people was that they had some kind of run in with the justice department in one way or another, or the legal system at one point in their lives. And there was a sense of kind of distrusting of authority. And even the judge himself, Judge Yonker said that you know, that in and of itself isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's good to be skeptical, right? But would you be able to kind of put that aside and just judge the case on the merits of the facts? There was another woman who said that she would do what she thought was right, whether or not the law 
uh, agreed with her, right? So she thought that something was morally wrong, even what, regardless of what the actual law says, she would go with what she felt was right and her truth, if you know what I mean. So if the law requires you to find somebody uh, innocent, if there is, um, you know, a reasonable doubt that has been introduced by the defense lawyers. If there's reasonable doubt, you have to find these men innocent. Well, if she decided she didn't like them, she was basically going to do what she thought was right, regardless of what the law says. So I thought that was kind of interesting as well. But here we have another thing from the Detroit Free Press covering one potential juror's personal connection to the case via her daughter-in-law. This was wild to listen to. Uh, juror's daughter-in-law got high with kidnapped defendant Fox near the Whitmer cottage. The uh, governor, Gretchen Whitmer, kidnapped retrial kicked off with some bizarre movement in the jury box. A juror was already dismissed due to sickness. Oh, there were a lot. That's a another thing, and we'll get to that in a minute. And her replacement comes with a due of a tale. During jury selection Tuesday, the woman disclosed her daughter-in-law came into contact with the defendants at the boat launch near Whitmer's Cottage in the summer of 2020. That's where prosecutors allege the suspects went to scope out the governor's vacation house to prepare for the kidnapping. However, the prospective juror said her daughter-in-law was intoxicated that day and doesn't remember anything about it. Testimony in the first trial on the alleged kidnapping plot mentioned the woman as having smoked marijuana with defendant Adam Fox. Crazy the juror said of the incident. And I have that linked here. The Michigan jury pool must be small. The article can be read in full here. Yeah, what was interesting about that was that this woman is being brought onto the jury and her daughter-in-law had like a tenuous connection with it. Um, she did talk to the FBI, by the way. She just claims to have not really remember anything that happened that day. But there were another a number of people that were concerned with like the financial aspect of this. You know, there were a number of people who are working class Michiganers and they cannot afford to take two to three weeks off to sit as a juror on this case. You know, a lot of them were saying the $50 stipend that you get paid each day. I make more than that on my job and I'm struggling and barely making ends meet as it is. There were a number of people who had uh, who had become ill or had there was a man that was just diagnosed with MS there was a woman whose mother had just been diagnosed with breast cancer and she was really upset about that and said she felt like it would be hard for her to focus, you know, on this. Um, and a number of other just very sad things where you kind of really get a sense of like people in Michigan and how they are being kind of financially burdened right now. And it's a really hard time for everybody, not just with the um, insane medical costs, you, you know, in the healthcare system in America, how bad it is. Uh, but just people barely making ends meet and not even being able to sit on a jury, basically because of the financial burden that would put on you to have to take two to three weeks off of work. And what you're getting, hello, with inflation is not enough to compensate you for this. So that's something that I think is, we should consider as well. BuzzFeed's Ken Benzinger reports on day one of the retrial after jury selection. So typically what you would call that would be day one since it's the day one of the actual trial. Jury selection was August 9, but you wouldn't call that day one of the trial. It would be the next day. So this is after jury selection, technically day one of the actual trial. Um, I listened in yesterday. Uh, I called in and I listened in for a little bit, but because I was so sick and I had a fever and stuff, I, I found it impossible to focus. I trust Mr. Bessinger um, of BuzzFeed to get it right because, hey, he's the one that kind of broke a lot of the stuff about the uh, FBI informants. He is the one that broke the story about FBI Special Agent Jason Chambers, the lead agent in the case, operating a private intelligence company called X-Intel that was seeking multi-million dollar contracts with the federal government to advise on cases of DT. That was actually BuzzFeed that broke that. And I think Mr. Benzinger should get more credit for the work he's done on this as well. Uh, Ken Benzinger on Twitter, quote, the retrial in the Michigan kidnapping case began today in Grand Rapids. The jury impaneled yesterday heard opening arguments and then met the first witness, the FBI's Todd Rainick, who was the case agent for Ty Garbin, a Wolverine watchman who pled guilty in early 2021. And I feel bad for Garbin because I think that he was of the uh, impression that, you know, once the federal government has you in their sights, like you are guaranteed to lose because they have all of the power, all of the resources, and 
entrapment defenses usually never work. They're almost always unsuccessful. So I think that he took that plea deal not really expecting the outcome that happened uh, at the trial, which I don't think any of us uh, really expected, despite all of the evidence that showed that the FBI entrapped these men. He says, quote, as in the prior trial in March and April, Rainick was used by the prosecution to introduce recordings, video, and Facebook messages involving the two remaining defendants, Barry Croft and Adam Fox. Some of what the jury heard had been played earlier this year. Some was new. Uh, quote, because Rainick was not the main case agent in the probe, he's a safe choice by the DOJ to introduce the material on the theory that the defense won't be able to score too many points on cross as compared to what they could do with the primary agents who aren't expected to testify. So that would be Jason Chambers, Henrik Impala, and Richard J. Trask. All three accused of misconduct um, and just outrageous behavior. <laughs> Quote, nonetheless, Chris Gibbons, Adam Fox's attorney, managed to catch Rainick in an apparent contradiction when he said that certain anti-government recordings were made before Fox ever met an FBI agent or operative. The DOJ point that was that Fox and Croft harbored such feelings without the government's help. But Gibbons pointed out that at least one of those recordings was made two days after Fox had attended a meeting in Ohio where at least three informants, CHSs, were present. Those are FBI informants. And that meeting was call essentially managed by Steve Robeson, a 20-year felon and FBI informant who the FBI later burned and claimed had been acting as a double agent and, and they are not calling him to testify because I think he knows a lot of things about what the FBI was doing, about what their intentions were and how they were running this thing that the FBI does not want to come out. Quote, Rainick, confronted with that, attempted to parse his testimony to say he was referring only to the FBI agents and informants assigned to the Watchman case at the time, but it was a thin line to walk since at least two of those CHSs would prove integral to the big probe. Exactly. Quote, Cross of Rainick is expected to wrap up tomorrow and then we'll likely hear from Christopher Long, the FBI agent assigned to Croft who testified last time and after that, potentially, the undercover FBI agent Mark and then primary informant Dan Chappell. Okay, so that was yesterday. Here are my notes from today. Uh, it began with Josh Blanchard, that's the attorney for Barry Croft, continuing his cross of Special Agent Rainick. He asks about FBI executing search warrants for a Facebook account in using a non-disclosure order, which means that when the FBI presents a search warrant to a company, if they have um, an, a non-disclosure order with it, it means that that company cannot inform the target of the active search warrant on them. They just turn over the information to the feds, but the person who the warrant has been served on, they don't know that the FBI has executed a search warrant. So they're in the dark about it. The targets do not know their communications are being monitored. FBI uh, confidential human source Dan Chappell is running the FTX, aka field training exercises. He is training men to get out of cars with guns and perform what they called a tactical retreat. Barry Croft never attended those exercises. Then we get to the meetings at the VAC shack. Undercover... Um, FBI agent Mark, they call it a UCE, undercover employee, undercover federal agent Mark was present at least at one of these meetings in the basement of the vacuum repair shop where Adam Fox was living at the time. Remember, he was homeless. He was living in the basement of a vacuum repair shop. So when they had these meetings at the vac shack, Barry Croft never attended those meetings. He wasn't even there. At the barbecue, where the three percenter oaths were taken and administered, once again, Barry Croft was not there. The FBI decided that they wanted to end and wrap up the investigation on October 7th, 2020. Now, they kind of asked and uh, the answer was evaded, but why that date in particular? Why did they, why did the FBI think that this was an important date, right? Well, it is a month before the election. So it seemed time for maximum damage, politically speaking. Uh, and that's all I'll say here because we're already two strikes. Lord have mercy. 
The FBI admits they came up with a ruse to get the guys to come. Offers of free gear, hot wings, and beer. So free food, free drinks, free gear. I mean, that a lot of these guys, they were only showing up to these uh, meetings and these training exercises because they were given free food, free beer, and um, Dan was, in many cases, driving around and picking them up. So they didn't even have gas money. That's how broke a lot of these guys were. We're talking about basically indigent poverty level stuff, okay? So when they get offers of, hey, we're going to give you free gear, free food, free beer, yeah, they're going to show up, okay? The FBI admits that they did not give details of what that free gear would be to the defendants. So they didn't know what kind of gear the federal government was going to give them. Barry Croft was not invited on that trip. This is the trip where the guys would get arrested, and there were four informants and uh, two undercover agents present. You know, it was almost all uh, informants and feds, except for a couple of the other guys that weren't. But it was mostly the FBI doing this, right? They wanted the guys to attempt to purchase a, an explosive device uh, that was being offered to them by UCE's Mark and Red. So these are undercover federal agents, Mark and Red, that were trying to get these guys to... Uh, purchase and an explosive. Uh, no one made any sort of down payment for that, nor any promise to do so. They wanted to offer this to the guys for four thousand dollars, right? Oh yeah, we're gonna we're gonna come up with this for you guys if you all want to buy it. And the guys did not have the financial ability to buy that in the first place. But even if they did, they didn't do it. They didn't even offer a down payment. Nothing. So, you know, they kind of wanted to get them on purchasing this and it didn't happen and then we get to the really amazing part and i think that the uh this is the most important thing uh out of the entire two days so far of what happened the fbi admitted they planted explosives material in a defendant's vehicle so they could seize it when they arrested him now they tried to spin that as oh we needed to go into the vehicle secure the vehicle and look for evidence right that was their excuse for this but they just admitted to planting evidence on somebody. Like, that should have been the, <laughs> the end of this right there. Like, you don't, we don't do that. You're not supposed to do that. That's not how our justice system is supposed to work. So I just thought that that admission in and of itself was stunning. And that should be the end of it right here. Like, these guys were entrapped. You planted stuff on them. Done. But of course, they, they're going to persist and continue with this nonsense narrative because that's what the government does. And they'll try to say, yeah, we did plant evidence, but you know, it was a good thing because we needed to do that to make sure everybody was safe. And so make sure that they didn't get rid of any evidence, potential evidence in their vehicles so we could seize it. Right. Okay. I, how can you trust anything that the FBI says after that admission? Barry Croft, not in any of the group chats where the invite to the ruse trip was posted. Just another point. Now, that was the end of Rainick, uh, Special Agent Rainick's testimony. The next witness is special, uh, FBI Special Agent Christopher Long. Christopher Long started working with a confidential human source, Jenny Plunk, around the end of May, right before the June 6 meeting. She's from Tennessee. Another person provided the FBI with a complaint that Croft was organizing a group of individuals for a meeting. That person informed them that the information wasn't his firsthand information, but in fact, he learned it from Jenny Plunk. Plunk was convinced, quote unquote, to come forward to the FBI. Chris Gibbons asks about rules and admonitions to confidential human sources. There's a large list of ad, uh, admonishments. The ones that are typical was given to Plunk, uh, Mr. Long claims. So basically things like, you know, you don't represent the FBI, you're not an, an FBI agent, you are simply an informant, you're supposed to be there to kind of observe and act as a, you know, a, a listening device, basically, for the feds. Um, he claims the CHS work was voluntary and that the CHS could walk away at any time. They like to say that, but a lot of times they coerce people into becoming informants. And it's sort of like, well, you know, we'll we'll dig up anything and we'll find a reason to charge you with a crime. We'll find something you did. We'll dig through your entire life and we will charge you if you don't continue to act as a CHS for us or if you don't agree to do this. It's basically these subtle threats that they do. 
So while they claim it's voluntary, I mean, you really have to ask yourself, is that true? Because they hold all the power. There's a massive power imbalance between an individual and the entire Justice Department of the United States. Let's be real. Long claims CHS should not be telling targets what to do and shouldn't be running the group. Well, that's just stunning, considering numerous times we see uh, text messages between the FBI handling agents telling confidential human sources to tell people what to do to draw specific people into the plot, to manufacture a plot, to push people to come up with a plot and a plan. Um, and we have Dan basically running the Watchmen and conducting their field training exercises. So I just found that to be kind of bizarre that he would make that admission there. When we know that they were violating basically those rules. Jenny had a role she was playing as a CHS on behalf of the FBI with regards to militia. She was pretending to be the head of the militia, executive management of the Tennessee Three Percenters Militia. Did she know Robinson before meeting you? Gibbons asks. And Long says, yes, I believe so. So Jenny Plunk already knew another FBI informant, Steve Robson, before she started to work with them. Jenny was at the June 6th Dublin, Ohio meeting. She was in Cambria, Wisconsin for the FTX. Robeson organized. She was at a meeting in Peebles, Ohio. Long was provided with audio from the meetings. Long claims the audio from the meetings gives him some knowledge, but not personal knowledge, of what was said. Quote, do you have an understanding Robson is a leader of Wisconsin Three Percenters? Unquote. Quote, you did other things to document what was happening at these meetings and events. Unquote. You make reports, right? You made reports in this case. Long says yes. You look for documentation, right? Long says yes. So basically what he was saying is you're not just, he's asking Christopher Long, this FBI agent, you're not just listening to this audio, you know, and taking what your informants say at face value, right? Like you're trying to find independent information to cooperate these claims. You're not just going off of like random pieces of information and then things that informants are saying. You're trying to document and cooperate these claims. And Long said that was correct. That's what you're supposed to do. So he says, did Jenny Plonk sit on a national board of directors for the three percenters? Uh, did you maintain contact and involve? Did she maintain contact and involvement with Three Percent Patriot Militia National Organization? Long says if she did, she did it freely of her own free will and not at the behest of the FBI. At these meetings, let's focus on Dublin. Robson was outfitted with a recording device. What kind is it? Long says they it's a covert recording device designed to look like something innocuous. This one was designed to look like a credit card. So that is incredible. Just to give you guys an idea of like what they can do now with technology. And the, the U.S. attorney, Nils Kessler, he objected to this. He tried to make it sound like, oh, they're exposing the, the methods of the FBI. Like, F off, okay? Even the judge said no. You know, that he shouldn't even have suggested that a defense attorney was trying to do something like that. No, the reason you need to know this stuff is because it's important to provide context to what was going on and, and how the FBI conducted this particular operation, if you want to call it that, rather than an investigation, because it appears to be an operation. So just to give you an idea that they can have recording devices now designed to look like a credit card that you can have in a wallet. So you'll have no way of knowing. Like, you you do a pat down, right? Someone's not wearing a wire, all right? They don't do that anymore. So when you see these Hollywood movies of people having to tape a wire under their shirt or have a transmitter between their legs or something like that or built into a belt buckle and they have this wire on their shirt, you can, oh, there there's this fear when they're being patted down that they're going to be found out and something's going to happen. That's not the case anymore. The technology is such that you would have no way of knowing if someone was wired for audio because they're not going to be wearing a wire. They'll be carrying a key fob on a keychain that you'll have no way of knowing is a listening device or a credit card that you'll have no way of knowing is a listening device. So just to put that out there to give you guys an idea of like how Hollywood presents things versus reality. It did not have a transmitter, nor did Jenny. So it was specifically 
a recording device that they would listen to after the fact. It wasn't transmitting it in real time. Plunk was a new CHS, so they didn't provide her with something that she could potentially show the targets. They said that they, they had trust issues. That's what this FBI agent said. She's a new source, so if we give her a listening device, a recording device, she could walk up and show the defendants, hey, look at what the FBI gave me, and then that would be exposed. So they're sort of like a development of these sources, right? You want to make sure you have total control of them before you give them certain things. Uh, were other CHSs present at that meeting? Besides Robson Plunk, Long says one other confidential human source was at that nationwide meeting of militia groups. So at least three FBI informants, potentially more, maybe even undercover federal agents. We don't really know. We're going by what Long says. Long and his information might be limited. He might not actually know. He might only be aware of three. There could be more, and he just doesn't have that knowledge. Long could not confirm or deny that he was CEO for the state of Missouri, talking about Robson of the Missouri Three Percenters. Um, Exhibit 40 from Dublin, Ohio, an audio recording saying, hold on, hold on. It's Steve Robson, the CHS. He's actually leading the meeting and keeping order. He's calling people to order, calling the meeting to order. So it shows that Robson, the FBI informant, was the one leading this nationwide meetup of militia groups, and he was in charge of that meeting, basically on behalf of the FBI. Did you find any GoPros in a vehicle? He says they weren't specifically looking for them, but if they did confiscate them, it's possible that they reviewed them. So there was talk, right, about at that meeting about having people wear GoPros and be operators in the field that never came to pass. So this is the thing about uh, guys trying to talk tough, right? You get a, a group of militia guys together at a meeting. Yeah, they're gonna try to talk tough, okay? It's just something that's gonna happen. Also, there were girls there, like Jenny Plunk, an FBI informant. And these guys, it's very, it becomes very obvious that they're trying to impress the ladies when they're talking to them. And so obviously that was her role there. Um, so there's talk about operators and guys that would be wearing GoPros. Do you know who those guys are? That's what uh, Chris Gibbons, Adam Fox's defense attorney, asks Christopher Long. Long says no. He says, Mr. Robson says on this uh, audio, what are we doing? We need a plan. Barry Croft says, Monday, when I get back, I'm telling my boss Monday. So that would have been June 8th, right? He would have gone back to... Uh, his own state, June 8th, and he claimed at this meeting he was going to tell his boss that basically he's going to quit his job. He says, when I get back to work, I'm going to quit. I'm a goner, and then I'm going to go into the field and start operating. Again, this is tough talk that is nonsense. So he asks the FBI agent, well, Barry Croft said he was going to do that at this meeting. Did he actually do it? Did he quit his job? Did he speak to his employer? Christopher Long admitted that no, this was all basically tough talk. He never did any of the things he claimed he was going to do. He maintained his employment. He did not go into the field and start operating or do any of the, um, you know, things that he claimed he was going to do. He didn't attack anybody, as he claimed at that meeting he would do, trying to look tough. Long claims that Croft consented for them to search his phone at the arrest site to make sure it wasn't in lock mode. Long says he did phone extraction. Barry Croft did not do anything to interfere or delay this. Now, the government has made a lot of stink about the guys talking about OPSEC, right? Oh, these guys were talking about operational security, so that means there must have been an operation. But, you know, <laughs> Barry Croft didn't even have a passcode on his phone, and he gave it to, he, he gave the FBI permission. He consented to them doing a search of the phone so they didn't even have to get a warrant. So, you know, when you're talking about OPSEC, it doesn't appear that he had any operational security. He says, quote, you've talked about OPSEC, unquote. This is something they talked about at these meetings to avoid detection or leaving evidence of what they're doing. Quote, you would agree it didn't appear Croft had wiped his phone at any point. He didn't even have a passcode, unquote. They recovered data and reviewed it. Things like his text messages, phone calls, his Facebook account, etc. Uh, Long confirmed that. Long says he can't say that Croft was trying to hide any information on his phone. 
because uh, Gibbons asks, is that good OPSEC? And Long said it could be if he wasn't keeping anything on his phone in the first place. Uh, this was located in his car, right? They pull up a receipt for the fireworks. Barry used his real name at a store. Again, no operational security being employed. Long said that that was poor OPSEC. Gibbon says, how about no OPSEC? Long was the case agent for Mr. Croft, by the way. Uh, for people to understand, he's the lead agent investigating Croft. He's also the handling agent of FBI informant Jenny Plunk. <laughs> So Croft was not participating in encrypted chat platforms with men in Michigan. Long claimed his truck, Barry's truck, he was a truck driver, could have been used as a battering ram. But they've never actually seen him use his vehicle in a dangerous manner. They called it an 80,000 pound battering ram. But Barry never harmed anyone with his truck and he never used it as a battering ram. Just to show you <laughs> how the FBI talks about things. Long claimed Croft was making an IED. He used a form of smokeless powder. He was assisted in Cambria by Daniel Harris and others, including Ty Garbin, who was one of the guys, the first guy that took a plea deal in this case. Quote, you've reviewed the audio at Cambria, unquote, that Garbin and Harris were participating. Transcripts are brought up. Fox was not present when the statement was made at Cambria meeting a day before the FTX. Robson, his wife, and Barry Croft were talking about someone named Roxanne in Missouri, uh, from Missouri, a veteran. So she had talked, uh, Steve Robson talked about someone named Roxanne that was, you know, going out and doing stuff in the field. And so they're asked about her. Is she a real person? And Long says, yes, yeah, she's a real person. The FBI claims to have tracked her down, but didn't talk to her or investigate her, which is interesting. The bomb that they tried to make at Cambria did not explode or detonate. Apparently, they tried to make several of them, but none of them functioned as designed. They were not, they, they were smoking at most. They didn't even catch fire. Uh, Long got, by the way, direct, uh, direct hired uh, by the FBI from the military. He was a direct hire because he was former military. Quote, in your experience or training, have you ever heard of a Drano bomb? Unquote, Gibbons asks. Quote, I can't say I have specifically heard the terminology Drano bomb, but I do know that household chemicals can be used to make explosives or chemical reactions, unquote, Long says. Uh, Long says, I can't give you a name of anything specific. Gibbons, can you make a device out of Drano and sugar? Long says, I can't say. Jenny Plunk was your CHS. She was working for you June 6, 2020. She was reporting for the FBI. You authorized her to do certain things in her role as a CHS. Long says Plunk created Facebook pages for people. She was instructed to make these by Steve Robson, another FBI CHS. So Long tried to say, well, the FBI didn't instruct her to do this. Oh, it was just another person working for the FBI that instructed her to do that. So, so it's, you see the way they try to like weasel their way out of admitting what they were doing and how they try to use these informants to sort of put a buffer between them and these investigations. The FBI team handling CHS Jenny Plunk had a nickname for defendant Barry Croft, Bonehead. Long had personally called him this. So they, just to show you the animosity these people have for the individuals with which they're investigating, you know, we're supposed to believe that these are unbiased, objective people, but they're referring to this guy as Bonehead. It also shows you they think that he's stupid, you know, it, it It's just so disturbing. Text messages from FBI agent to Plunk referred to Croft as BH, which Long admitted stood for Bonehead. As part of your investigation of Croft, you watched his public-facing profile page, correct? Long says yes. They would obtain warrants for all his pages using non-disclosure orders so he wouldn't be aware of them monitoring him. They executed three warrants of Croft just for his Facebook pages. There was a time your investigation of Croft and the the Michigan investigation collided, right? Long says, yes. CHS Dan was working for the government as early as March 2020, right? He says, I'm not sure when Dan was opened as a source because he wasn't Dan's handling agent. He said, you had some information Croft might attend some protests and meetings. Long says, yes, we wanted to see what he's doing at these meetings. Croft, so they started surveilling him. And that was their justification for doing so. Oh, he talked about attending meetings and protests. So, 
that was all the probable cause they needed to start physical surveillance of him. So they surveilled him in April of 2020 for four shifts, right? They learned that he worked as a truck driver, that he hauls a big truck that says Amazon. They learned he may have three kids who live with him at his residence. Is that correct? And Christopher Long says, yes, you never saw him commit any crimes. You just saw him go to work and come home. Long says, correct. His uh, postings on Facebook are what triggered the surveillance. So a TEI, Terrorism Enterprise Investigation, highest level DT case uh, in the FBI's arsenal. It allows them to use all of the investigative tools the FBI has available to them. Basically, this is... You get to use the big resources, right? And it requires approval process to open and close TEI cases. Long said that he had no say over the Wolverine Watchman case being a TEI investigation. Long was not Robson's handler. He was Jenny's handler. But he did learn that Robson was working with the FBI and he learned his identity. Corey Baumgartner was Robson's final CHS handler. Long claimed they got a tip that Croft was planning something really big quote unquote. They got this second hand by someone who knew Plunk and learned it from her. This person is not working as a source for long. Now we don't know if he is working for the federal government, but for somebody else. That was the end of the hearing, so we'll learn more tomorrow, but um, I think it's really interesting and illuminating to kind of show this stuff to, for you guys so you can understand like what is happening and how this sort of thing works because there was a perception that, like, the government can do no wrong, they're always right, and that's simply not true. These are, they're regular people, you know, they're people like you and me. And uh, just to hear how they're referring to the people that they're supposed to be investigating in an objective, unbiased manner, they're calling them bonehead, you know, things like that. It's just uh, it, admitting to planting evidence. <laughs> uh, it, you, when you think that it can't get any more egregious, uh, it does. So that's where we are today, and we will pick up more tomorrow uh, when day three begins.